Hello there, welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to my sewing room for another project today. Today I thought I would go ahead and make the ultimate femme fatale summer dress out of a cotton sateen. No one is surprised. A lot of repeated elements in my design work here today. But I did want to go ahead and show you how to add an exaggerated or padded shoulder to the all-in-one sleeve. I use the all-in-one sleeve version of my blocks here all the time and I will be using those again today. Modifying the darts on them to be kind of a more fun arrangement of darts, I suppose, and then also modifying the shoulder to incorporate shoulder padding and then dropping that shoulder off a little bit, the sleeve changing it up a little bit. You'll see what I mean in just a moment when we, of course, as always, jump on over to the blue patterning table of doom. All right, here we are. I've got a little sketch here just to kind of keep myself on track for what I want to do for this dress. Um, the biggest modification I'm going to be making to the all-in-one here is to move the waist darts into a kind of centralized I don't know, starburst from the waist kind of uh, arrangement. So I'm going to have them point directly to the center front of the waist here. So I'm going to add this start in going right here or move it over. And then I'm going to change this regular neckline for my block just into my little shallow V necklines I like doing. And then I have these huge shoulder pads that I'm going to put in here. So I'm going to raise the shoulder from the uh, shoulder point here. That little tack mark in the middle of that line you see is where like the tip of my shoulder actually is. So from there on it, this pattern is basically sleeve, but I'm gonna add a go, I'm gonna go ahead and add like five eighths of an inch above this little mark here to fit that shoulder pad in to really extend the shoulder up. And then for this sort of style, I actually like it to extend off my shoulder as well. So I'm gonna come out another inch uh, here uh, past my shoulder point basically, so that I'm extending not only the shoulder up, but also out and then the sleeve is going to drop off of this area. It's gonna fold down like over the shoulder a tiny bit and then drop off over here. So I'm just gonna try and create a little bit of a angle here where the sleeve will drop off that new shoulder point that I've created. And then I have to connect that down, of course, to the underarm area basically, essentially. And then I was thinking, oh, I wanna add more seam allowance. So that's what I've done here. And then down here, I don't want my seam allowance to be pointed like that, I want to square it off like this, just so that it's easier to hem this later. But here is my new, like, modification to the all-in-one. It's not that different, doesn't look that different in the end from the regular all-in-one sleeve, but basically I'm just raising that shoulder up to um, add more room to put that shoulder pad in there, and then extending it off the shoulder a little bit as well, and I'll just put padding in there, because my shoulder won't hold it out an inch extra. I can't, you know, have an extra inch on my shoulder but I can add it with padding, so that's what I'm gonna do. Um, and I'll just cut this out here and we can start doing the dart manipulation as well. Hopefully that made sense up there. Um, kind of just play around with what you want. Like I know how much I want to do up there based off of the thickness of the shoulder pad I'm adding. And then also based off of just previous experience playing around with things like this before. Of course, if you're new to something, um, like incredibly new to pattern drafting, it's always good to make a muslin perhaps. Here I'm just cut up that purple line where I want my dart to be, and I'm moving it over. And I'll cut off the old excess here, so I've just closed that dart. I slashed and spread, but I just spread it from the waist to a different part of the waist. And then I'm actually going to add in a second dart here, and I'm gonna make it a little bit shorter than this first one. So I'm just gonna add in another dart here, and to do so I'm going to draw another line where I want my dart to be, like so. And I'm just going to add in a little bit of a dart here. I just want it to be more almost of a style line than actually a functional dart. So I'm going to fill it in like this. So I'm going to have a tiny dart here. And you will see what this looks like in the end. Um, but this is more just because I wanted to have two darts radiating from the center front here. So I'm just going to create a very tiny dart here and use most of it in the other one. You can split this completely evenly, whatever you want to do. It doesn't really matter. Because I just decided that because I wasn't going to take this second smaller dart all the way up to the apex, um, because I wanted it to be a little bit shorter than the first dart for design reasons, that I didn't want to put that much um, fullness into it because I didn't want to have extra fullness at the dart tip, kind of. Um, so I just kept this really small just because I wanted a line there of stitching more so than because I wanted another full functional dart. Goodness! Doesn't take me long to get confusing. <laughs> as ever. So now normally from my apex, I come down an inch and a quarter. That just is what works for me and my shape. Um, so that's what I'm gonna do for this first dart here. And I'm gonna redraw my dart legs in. So that's that first dart that I moved over here. And then the second little one, I'm not going to, I'm gonna come down like two inches from the apex as opposed to um, an inch and a quarter. So 
think I come down like a full three inches. Here we go, yeah. Like so. And so I just have this one main dart that's like the functional dart, and then the second one is almost just more of a little style line that I've added in here. So that this area that I'm coloring in pink here, technically this is an amount of fullness I'm adding to this because I'm not going to be closing that part of the dart, but because it is so small, I think it'll be okay. Because it is so small and my uh, bust is not small, it should all work out in the end. But those are the modifications I'm making to the front of the bodice here. Of course, I will have to make the same sleeve sort of modifications to the back here. And then I decided, hey, why not? While we're here, we'll point the back darts a little bit more towards the waist as well. I don't ever put the back darts directly into the center back waist just because uh, that's where the zipper is going to go and I don't want to have to deal with anything extra going on where I want the zipper to be. And in fact, this um, project today, you'll see me, I press all of my darts or plan to and then do press all of my darts towards the side seams instead of the centers. Um, some of you have told me that this is how you were taught to sew. I was taught to sew uh, with all the darts always pointed, like folded towards the center front or center back, but like clearly it doesn't matter too, too much because you can switch. I think what's most important here is that you, you know, do it the same on both sides. <laughs> so like you don't have one dart on the front pointed towards the center and one point the side. That might look a little strange unless you were doing it for a specific design reason. Um, but here I am, I'm raising the shoulder again for that shoulder pad up here in the back. I'm just kind of using the front as a reference for this little angle along the shoulder. And then again, I will connect that down to the underarm. And again, just referencing the front pattern to get the correct shape over here. Tracing all I need, like so. So that the back will match up with the front still, like so. And again, I raised my uh, center back neckline because my block is too low for whatever reason. I just need to trace a new block and fix that. I still do the, get that question often, what that black um, block is made out of, and it's just black poster board. Uh, it's just fancy because it's a fun color, or lack of color trim off all my excess paper here and then I can move this dart. You can see I drew a purple line that's more angled so the dart will be just a slightly more pointed towards the center back as opposed to straight up and down. So I'll slice up to the uh, dart point here and then swing this dart closed and moving therefore the fullness over and I will cut the excess off like so and now I can fill in this new dart. There's not really enough paper to do that with Esposito. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. All right, here we go. Fill that in. Again, I'm going to not want to fold this towards the center so I don't have to deal with it getting too close to my zipper. So I'm folding this towards the side this time. Don't usually see me do that kind of thing. But again, it will not matter in the end, I promise. As long as you keep these things consistent. Again, I'll just use my awl to poke holes in the dart legs and dart point here, just so that I can transfer it onto my um, fabric later once I have these cut out. Front and back, do a little bit of labeling here. Of course, that front is gonna be, uh, and it's femme fatale dress is why the <laughs> FFD. And then I'm going to do some dart modification to the pencil skirt pattern that I'll be wearing with this as well, or using for this as well. Um, this is just my regular block pencil skirt pattern that you've seen me make here on the channel. I can put a card up to that here. If you want to make a pencil skirt block for yourself as well, but here's mine. And you can see this poster board wasn't white enough, so I've added on extensions to the end of it in white so that this can be 29 inches long, because that's how long I cut my skirts most of the time. I like my skirts quite long. Transferring over my dart markings and everything. And I will draw in my darts for the front of my skirt here. And I'm drawing in my darts, and then I'm going to move them. But, you know, oh well. So once again, I'm going to point these so that they meet up with the bodice darts in the center. So I want to make sure that I plan accordingly, I guess. So I'm going to have this line come to the center front. And then from there, I want to see where that other dart needs to be. It needs to be right here. So it's going to be, you know, quite a different angle. But that's all right. We'll do this first one first, and then... We'll do the first one first, shockingly. And then I will move the other dart. So cut down the new dart leg. Cut down the old dart leg. Swing the old one shut like so, and that opens up the fullness in the center front, as you can see. So that's my new dart over here, and then I wanted another dart here, and now that I have that closed, it makes it easier to do this second one. And so I can again cut down the new dart, cut down the old dart, and close the old one, like so. Overlap that, and tape shut. So now I have my two 
skirt waist darts, but they're pointed towards the center front and they will match up with the new ones on the bodice as well. Like so, so I'll fill these in. Fill these in. And again, I'm gonna fold the fullness facing outwards toward the side seam, just to keep it consistent across the entire project here. All right, so there are my new darts all filled in. Again, I'll just use my awl to poke the dart points and legs so that when I am later have these cut out, I can trace that with colored pencil through the pattern. Usually, sometimes Taylor's chalk, but normally colored pencil, who are we kidding? This is gonna be cut on the fold, and this is the Femme Fatale Dress Skirt Front 2021, and I can cut the rest of this out. And then we can fix the darts on the back in a similar fashion, of course. Set that front aside, and go ahead and trace my back skirt pattern. Just barely fits on this piece of paper. We'll make it work. Like so. Once again, draw in my original darts. Only so that I can get rid of them. I'm just going to draw in my seam allowance down the back of this as well. Like so. Just so I can keep track of everything that's going on. I think originally I was going to add a kick pleat to this too, and then I was like, you don't have enough fabric. Because I'm just using black cotton sateen to make this dress today. Um, but I was using it from like it was like a random piece that was like clearly I had cut a project out or something and then this was like the leftovers. I found it like here in the stash somewhere. So I'm using random leftover instead of um, full yardage. So I didn't actually have a wide enough piece to be able to cut this skirt with a kick pleat. So I was going to try and finally demonstrate that for you, but then I did I, I couldn't. I'm sorry. Once again, I'm just re-angling these back darts so that they point towards the waist a little bit more. But again, keeping a buffer near the zipper because I just don't want to deal with Nonsense by the zipper. There are certain things I just, you know, don't do because if it's a little bit more irritating, <laughs> it's too much for me, usually. Uh, I'm like, oh no. So this one, again, I just need to keep the angle consistent is what I'm doing here. So um, I wanted to make sure that this dart was parallel with the first one. So that's what I was doing with this. It's been, you know, over a week since I made this as I'm recording this voiceover for you. So I don't exactly remember everything I've done because I've made other things in between because I like to pack my schedule. <sighs> so, see, here I am. I'm going to add a kick pleat back here. Oh, are you, Esposito? Oh, are you? So, normally I just sew these with like a slit back here, about this far down. This is about, what, six inches up. I'm just going to add a little kick pleat instead, like so, which is just, you can see, adding on about an inch out from the original seam allowance, adding its own seam allowance onto it. But then in the end, this wouldn't fit on my fabric. So that's how I wouldn't modify my pattern to add a kick pleat. You won't see how to sew it because in the end, it didn't really happen. It's a shame. I hope you're all doing okay out there. As you are hearing me, I'm speaking to you as always from the past, but from a little bit greater past than usual because I am kind of pre-filming this video or pre-making this video for this week because I'm going to be taking this week off to do some writing, which will hopefully boost my uh, mental facilities a little bit here just because I am a little bit burned out. I've tried to make like three videos in one week last week and uh, I think that that was probably too much. <laughs> so I could use a little bit of a break in fiction work instead. So that's what I'll be doing as you're listening to this. Hopefully I'm writing. That's the goal. Here I'm just making a little um, like trapezoidal shaped like pointed pattern for this sash on the side here. So I'm just making like an angled shape. And once again, like I would cut this out larger. And in fact, I have to cut this out in two pieces um, because, but like my fabric was weirdly shaped because it was a different project. Like it was cut leftovers from a different project. So I'm not able to cut out this full weird sash, sh sash shape, mm, hard to say, sash shape from my fabric, so I ended up having to cut this in two and then piece it together, which is a shame, but it worked out, so it'll be fine in the end. And you'll notice, like, this sash here on the drawing, for example, this actually hangs even more drapey than it will in the finished fabric. Talking about fabrics recently, this dress would work very well in a rayon crepe, but I just saw, I had this cotton sateen laying around, 
and that's why I made this a little bit more, the design a little bit more structured. Like there's nothing drapey going on on the top, it is still very structured, it's just the darts are in a fun place, and the shoulder's a little bit raised, but there's no like swags or gathering on the top of this, and that's because I was using a stiffer fabric like a cotton sateen. And that does mean that this little extra drape I'm going to put onto the skirt will stick out, it will hold its shape very well, it has a lot of body to it because of a medium weight cotton sateen. Um, as opposed to a drapey rayon where it would like lay against the body and be more floopy, as I always say. So today we're working with something that's not floopy here with the cotton sateen. And here you can just see me tracing neckline facings for this project as well. Usually I just put a little bit of paper over the neckline and then I just trace two and a half inches wide little facings for this. It's easy to make your facings match up perfectly when you're just tracing it from the original pattern. So center front, femme fatale dress front facing like so, and I will make one for the back as well. And my leg is asleep already. Shocking. I've mentioned here before on the channel that I actually have terrible circulation in my legs. It is true. But for the little sash on this, you could do something angled like I end up doing, um, or you could just do a straight across piece, or you could do the whole thing as like a big triangle, um, or a circle cut little sash. Usually I just do them as a rectangle. This time I decided to have uh, kind of chevron so that the side seam is a little bit shorter than the points hang in the front and back. But you'll probably see what I mean later. Oh, the camera just fell a little and now we're at a strange angle. How jaunty. A shame. <laughs> Here I've cut everything out, so I'm just going to set everything aside that needs to be surged. And I can go ahead and mark my darts on this, again with white colored pencil. Like so. You can see I poked holes with that all earlier in the pattern, so now I can use my colored pencil to Transfer, transfer those markings onto the back side of my cotton sateen here. Again, this is a cotton sateen with a little bit of stretch in it. I think this one was from Mood originally. I don't really remember because I'm not exactly positive which project. I use a lot of black cotton sateen, so to find some in the studio isn't that rare. Um, and it's hard to say which project it really came from to start with. But now it will become this dress. Salvaged, salvaged from the uh, stash here because Everyone knows, if I need something, it's another black dress, because <laughs> I just don't have enough of those. I don't need another black dress, but I'm always going to want another black dress. It's the part of me that wanted to be goth in high school and wasn't allowed to be, you know, still coming to the forefront here in adulthood. Again, just marking my darts on the back pattern pieces here as well. You've seen me do this kind of thing dozens of times here on the channel. Just marking my darts. You know, some people do this with, like, Taylor's tacks. They're so thorough. Some people do it with Taylor's chalk. And I just do it with regular old Prismacolor colored pencil because the only uh, only person who ever sees the inside of my garments is, well, me usually, but then also all of you. Um, but, but, but me, really. Um, you'll never see the inside of my dress again. I will. <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead and pinch and pin these darts. Usually use anywhere from, like, three to four pins. And pinning darts to make sure those lines match up and then I'll set this next to the machine. I like to sew my darts before I serge the raw edges of the main body of my garment. You can uh, finish the raw edges beforehand. You can always, uh, you know, do rayon seam binding or zigzag them on the like a regular zigzag stitch on the machine. You can see how I had to cut the skirt drape apart by the way. <sighs> so irritating. <laughs> so I had to cut this in many pieces and piece it together. So that's what I'm pinning here. But this is the general shape of the drape I'm going for here. And I have uh, four pieces for this. In an ideal world, I would have cut it out of two, honestly. But whatever. Here I can go ahead and trace my darts onto the front skirt piece here as well. I'll get to that later and then I'll know. It's this funny shape up there at the waistline. You can see why I pointed these darts towards the side seam so that they wouldn't overlap each other and get in the way transferring all those dart points and then connecting them with my ruler. And then I can just pinch and pin all those darts across the front here. It's the same number of darts as usual. It's just, uh, they are angled more. It doesn't change the fit at all. It just changes the style lines in the end. Um, and again, like, from about three feet away from me, you can't see the darts anymore. Like, um, this is kind of detail work that you only see when you're, like, right next to someone. Um, and I don't often stand right next to anybody, but that's alright. It could happen in the future. You never know when acceptable humans may come along, so... Just draw in these darts, and you can see how they're going to look. They're going to, like, radiate out from that center front. It's just a little bit fun. 
little bit of fun here for a all black <laughs> simple dress I'm trying to make it a little bit more interesting for you who are watching I could make simple black dress after simple black dress and be just as happy you know trying to add some variety to the situation and then of course marking and pinning the darts for the backs as well we're just going to speed through this though perhaps I have to say, I um, as I always say here, I don't actually believe in astrology. Uh, just that's what my disclaimer is: I don't believe in astrology. But I'm a Cancer, and uh, I'm very Cancer-like. And all the people I know fit their sign. It pisses me off because <laughs> I'm a very sciencey person in all other regards. I just get angry because I don't believe in astrology, but I do see it in all the people I know, which is very irritating. But I don't know what kind of planetary situation we're in right now, but my insomnia has been through the roof this last week. So if I'm a little bit extra loopy and weird today, just know it's because I think I got like four hours of sleep last night, maybe. I could not fall asleep. I, I was just awake in the middle of the night. I like put on a podcast, I took an antihistamine, and I hoped for the best, but I'm pretty sure it was like a four-hour situation in the end. So... Apologies for extra weird me today. That's just what we've got to work with. So over here on the machine, I can go ahead and sew all those darts that we just marked and pinned. Once again, I always start at the large end of the dart. I'm going to sew along my colored pencil mark. You see a lot of people don't mark their darts nearly as dramatically as I do. And uh, good for them, honestly. But uh, I just would rather have a line to follow. You know, so that's what I'm doing here. Just sewing that with like a 12 stitches per inch kind of stitch length. And then I'll sew right off the end of the point. And then I will tie that shut. Not, not pulling too hard, just pulling with enough tension, like a slight amount of tension down to the fabric. And I'll just tie this a couple of times and then I'll cut the threads with about an inch to spare left behind. And I just leave that free inside of my garment. Never had any trouble doing it that way. And then I will go ahead and sew all the rest of the darts in the very same way. That's right. I do have a video all about dart manipulation coming up here soonish to the channel. I'm going to be going over why darts <laughs> in more detail and showing some examples and different demonstrations about why darts and moving them, etc. Because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about darts out there because I get asked, I, don't know, I guess, frequently asked questions about darts and therefore I will try and answer them all in one dedicated video coming up here soon. But once all of my darts are sewn, I will of course take this over to the ironing board and press them all again towards the side seam this time. So that's what I'm doing here, just giving those a quick press. You can see how they look in the end here, meeting up as a V here in the center front. And then I'll just give the rest of this piece a press too while we're here. Why not? Everything's getting covered in lint because that is the fate of a sewing room. At least my cats aren't allowed in the sewing room, which is why you don't see them often. I'm sorry about that. They're not allowed in here because there's like pins and thread and I don't want them to get hurt themselves on anything or with anything or swallow thread and things like that. So they're not allowed in my sewing room. So I'm sorry you don't get more cat um, footage here. But it also means at least my projects don't get cat fur on them until I leave this room. <clears throat> but they do get covered in lint. So if they're in the sewing room, they're covered in lint. And as soon as they leave the sewing room and go back up like into my bedroom or something or into my closet where the cats live, then everything gets covered in cat fur. And unfortunately I have gray, well not unfortunately, I'm very fortunate to have my two gray kitties, but that does mean that their fur shows on light colored stuff and on dark colored stuff. So, you know, that's why witches have to have black cats, isn't it? Because then their fur won't show as much on their black clothing. That is the idea, but my cats are gray, so no such luck. I should say that they're not just my cats, they're my family's cats, but you know, here I have uh, accidentally um, just pressed the darts towards the center because I'm so used to doing it. And then I remembered, oh no, I'm supposed to press these towards the side. Oh, and look at me fighting a losing battle with this lint roller. Give it up, honey. All right, more darts to press. And then I will go ahead and surge all of this over on the serger, by the way. Like so, over here on the serger, which <laughs> looks extra haunted because I moved the light over here. Sometimes my special effects lighting comes out cooler than it deserves to, because I mean, this step isn't that exciting for having this much green light on it, but just turn the fog machine on next time as well. Really go for it. <laughs> just get extremely atmospheric, why not? Just go ahead and encase all the raw edges of my pieces here on the serger. The only thing I ever use the serger for, I don't ever sew with knits, 
so I have no need to actually sew pieces together with the serger. But that's all right. I just always uh, encase my raw edges with it. And that's why I don't have to care about like the tension on this machine very much either. If it gets a little bit off, who the heck cares? I'm just uh, making sure none of this unravels when it gets thrown in the wash later. Which reminds me, yes, I did pre-wash this fabric. Or I, I did back in the day before I found it for this project. I always pre-wash my sateens. You can wash and dry those. And once all those raw edges are encased in thread here, just bring that back over onto the ironing board and start pinning things together. I was trying to think about how do I want to hem these sleeves? I think I'll just hem them before I do anything else. So that's the plan currently here. I think I end up sewing the, together the side seams and then hemming it all at once. Yep, here I go. <laughs> if I remember correctly, I'm going to go ahead and do the side seams first, and then I will hem the sleeves, and then I will sew the shoulder seams. So that's going to be my order of operations. And, you know, again, I don't have an instruction book, so I am kind of just making up as I go along and hoping that I remember to do things in the correct order. Which, every once in a while, I'll do something in an inconvenient order. And then I'm really kicking myself, but... Today, I remembered, hmm, let's do this correctly. <laughs> Wild. Um, but before I sit down to sew, I'm going to batch process this, so I'm going to go ahead and pin the side seams of my skirt together first, so I can sew those at the same time. I always like to do things in batches, so pin everything I can, set it all next to the machine, sew everything I can, come back over here, press everything, pin everything, sew everything, in batches. Bit of an assembly line in here, you know? A one woman assembly line, as it were. And on the machine I can go ahead and sew those underarm seams, just with half inch seam allowance here. I'm actually going to throw an extra line of stitching in at that underarm area, just to reinforce it, because I do have to clip that seam. Where am I going? <laughs> I just got up from the sewing table and like, where, what happened? Where did I go? Did the phone ring? I don't know. Let's skip ahead. She's back. Okay, well, you know, don't know what happened there. <laughs> I'm leaving it in. Why not? Here, I'll stitch the other side as well. And then again, I'm just going to lay an extra line of stitching in just around this underarm curve, just for extra security, like so. Just back stitching at the beginning and end of that. So here again on the other side, right around that curve, just stitching right over the original line of stitching with a separate line, just for extra security at that underarm area because I do have to clip that curve later. And then I can go ahead and sew those side seams on the skirt here that I also pinned. And then I of course can press those side seams on the skirt open. So that's what I'm doing here. And again, giving this another little press, another little lint roll eventually here. Ugh. Just very attracted to lint. Using my tailor's ham here just to press the curved part of the hip, upper hip area open. Always pressing your seams open. It's very important, okay? Uh, I never actually clip this curve, by the way. Speaking of curves, I don't clip. But always press your seams, and the more acute the curve, the more you have to clip it, believe me. All right, so here's our skirt all together. I'll set that aside for now, so I can keep working on the bodice. Like so, so I have the side seams together. Ooh, like so. And now that I have the side seams together, I need to sew these shoulders. But before I do that, I'm going to hem the sleeves. Um, so I can do it all at once um, if I do it now. So I'll show you in just a second. Here I'm going to clip this curve that I was just talking about before. That's why I do that extra line of reinforced stitching in there. It's because I have to clip that curve, and it does weaken this area of the project just a little bit. So it's a shame, but what I do for an all-in-one sleeve. I love an all-in-one sleeve. All right, so this now, I have to sew the shoulders, but before that, I'm going to hem this while it's all one and flat. So I'm going to, this is this sleeve hem. It's hard to tell like where we are on the garment right here, but this is the hem of the sleeves. And because I can lay it all out nice and flat like this, might as well hem it now. Um, I'm going to hem this by machine, by the way. I was going to say I was going to machine hem it, whatever. You get what I'm saying. I'm going to hem this on the machine today. Usually you see me hand hem things, and I will hand hem the dress itself later, but I just figured I could get away with sewing this by machine today, and therefore I did. Once again, I can never explain <laughs> why sometimes I take shortcuts and sometimes I do things the hard way. Seems almost at random, honestly. But I'm just pinning that a half inch and then ironing it in place, and I will take it over to the machine so that I can sew this down. Just sewing that down over here from the outside, kind of just top stitching this hem, I suppose. I'm about a quarter of an inch away from the edge, the folded edge here, on the outside of the fabric. 
stitching that down. And you can see I'm just removing those pins as I go because I have them parallel to the uh, edge there as opposed to perpendicular. Can't sew over them if I do it like that, but eh. forces me to be good to remove the pins as I go, huh? And then back on the ironing board again, I can finally sew my darn shoulder seams together. And I have this funny little angle at the very end where it drops off the shoulder pad, or it will drop off the shoulder pad. Just start pinning this from the neckline edge out towards that shoulder. And hopefully you'll see what happens kind of over on the machine when I get to a corner like that. I'm just going to drop this off the edge a little bit. The cliff at the end of the shoulder pad. And I just actually ended up drawing in the seam allowance here just so I wouldn't get off track at all. Like so. And I can go ahead and stitch all the way off the edge because I have already hemmed my sleeve. But I'm just making sure I have my uh, mind in order here. I'm thinking, wait, I can just come off the edge, right? Because I already hemmed this? Yes. <laughs> I'm used to doing this where I don't hem the sleeves first, so I have to leave the last half inch unhemmed. If you hem the sleeves afterwards, you need to leave yourself a half inch along the edge here. But because I already hemmed them, I can sew right, right off the end. And the other dress that I made with this kind of sleeve modification recently, I actually fully lined it, so I was trying to think my way through this without having a lining. Back on the machine to go ahead and sew that. So you can see I'm starting at that funny little angle. Leaving the needle down, pick up the presser foot, turn the project, put the presser foot, presser foot back down, and keep sewing. That's how I get around corners cleanly. And I'm not curving that. You could curve that off the end of the shoulder, um, but I, I'm just leaving the point in there because I want it to be as sharp and angular as possible because that's just me. I don't actually anticipate many of you will want to have add shoulder pads to your things because I know I'm kind of in a minor minority of people who like shoulder pads. But it really does, I mean, they use them in the 40s, so it really does add a level of, I don't know, authenticity to a 1940s style garment when you do use shoulder pads in them. And this dress is kind of a 1940s slash 1950s dress. It has elements from both, um, like the more structured pencil skirt dresses like this would be more of like a 50s thing, but the raised and extended and very sharp shoulder is much more of a 1940s thing. Um, so maybe this dress in the end is almost like an 80s dress in that way, where I'm just like taking elements from the 40s and 50s and like smashing them together. So possibly, you know, this is just a mid-century inspired femme fatale dress that, depending on how you style it, it could look more 40s, more 50s, or even 1980s. Again, back over on the ironing board, I'm actually sewing all those pieces together for the sash, that's what that was. And now that I have my top here I finished, I can cut away a little notch above that point. You have to cut your corners, including this little funny angled corner up here. So I have to cut that so that this will lay flat and nice. Just like you have to clip curves, you have to cut corners as well. Make sure you cut your corners. <laughs> you know what I mean. But once this shoulder pad is in here, it's going to hold this out at like quite a point at my shoulder there, which is exactly what I'm after. Again, you can curve this area if you want it to be curved instead, and then you have to clip the curve instead of a corner. But I want it to be sharp and to put people's eyes out with my shoulders. That's the idea, you know? Really, the reason I wanted to make this dress is because I don't have a shoulder pad-tastic <laughs> black dress. And I was like, whoa, what a lapse in judgment. I have a lot of uh, 1940s black... Well, I say a lot. I have a few 1940s black suit jackets with good shoulder pad situation. But I don't have any dresses with a good shoulder pad going on. So I needed to remedy that immediately. And you can see I'm just figuring out the best way to press this using my tailor's ham because it is such an odd volumetric situation. I use the word situation far too often in these videos. I'm so sorry. It's the kind of thing I notice when I go back to edit and I'm like, why did you say that again? Kid, work with me. But I'll just pin my facings together at the shoulder seam here and sew those, of course, over on the machine. You can see I've surged the edges of those, but not the neckline edge. I never surge the or finish the neckline edges uh, if they're going to be finished with the facing because it gets kind of like encased and like folded within the facing area and it's not going to get much friction, so it'll be fine. Some people do put a line of stay stitching in the necklines though, just so that they don't stretch out. I just feel like what I do is I, I kind of go slowly and carefully around necklines and try not to stretch them out on purpose and I don't worry about stay stitching. So I'd rather just be delicate and not have to do that extra step. I don't know. It's up to you, where you're at in your sewing journey, etc. Or the fabric you're using, perhaps. If I was using something really loosely woven, I'd probably use stay stitching, but you don't catch me doing it very often now, do you? If ever. Have I ever done a line of stay stitching here on the channel? I'm not sure. Here, once again, I'm still piecing together my little 
side swoop sash. And I'm leaving, you can see this bottom like inch, I'm leaving open on this. That's because I need to hem this and it's gonna come together at a weird angle. So I'm leaving that open so I can finagle it later. And when I say later, I might just mean now. Here I am pressing that seam I just did open. This is gonna be right over the side seam on my dress eventually. And I need to hem this. Again, I'm gonna machine hem this whole sash situation. That's why I felt free to do it on the uh, sleeves there because I was like, well, I'm gonna machine hem the sash. So I might as well machine hem the sleeves. But I never machine hem a dress itself or a skirt. Oof, that's very rare. I have to be feeling super lazy. I just really prefer a hand done hem on a skirt. So you never catch me doing this kind of hem finish on the actual bottom of the hem. I don't know why I feel so strongly about such things, but you know, people are quirky and weird and I am no exception. So I'm just gonna pin that. I've actually just folded this a quarter inch twice. So it is finished cleanly on both sides. I don't want the serging to show on this sash when it like blows around in the wind or anything. If I were to ever stand outside, seems unlikely. I don't really leave the house even very much, as we know, because I have nowhere to go, okay? First of all, there was a pandemic. Second of all, I'm an introvert. Third of all, how do you make friends as an adult? Do tell if you are. If you have these secrets, let me know. I think most people do it because they meet them through their own children, and I don't plan on having any children, so just really is narrowing the pool further and further, honestly, of people to hang out with. Potential people to hang out with. I'd like some, but where do you find good humans? No idea. No idea. I feel like people meet people through their children, and they meet people through work. And I work alone, from home, and I have no children, and no plans to have children. So, really, I'm a little doomed here. Until then, I'll just build the wardrobe for when I do have places to go, I guess? Who knows? Like I said, I haven't slept, so, you know, there's that. I'm just pinning my neckline facing to the neckline, by the way matching up the shoulder seams, etc. I can then, of course, take that over to the machine and go ahead and sew that on. Just half inch seam allowance as usual. And then I will go ahead and clip this seam and do some understitching in here as well. Again, leave the needle down at the center V, press your foot up, turn, press your foot back down, keep sewing. That's how I get around corners cleanly here. Like so, and our neckline facing is on. I really like to finish as much as I can on the bodice before I attach the bodice and the skirt together. I just find that it makes it easier. And then here I will hem that sash again. Again, working in batches. So this has just been sitting here waiting for me to come back to the machine. And I will hem the sides of my sash. My my sash sides. It's just hard to say the word sash. Alrighty. Now I'm going to clip that center V and then along the curves of the neckline where it meets the facing here. Where it is now sewn to the facing, I suppose. And then I can... Go ahead and put in some understitching. So I'll go back over to the machine to do that, or I'll set this next to the machine to do that. And then I spilled pins everywhere. Nice of me. I need to get some more of these glass headed fine pins because all of mine are bent up from abuse. But now I will go ahead and hem again this sash. So that's what I do here now. Just gonna again turn this up, I don't know, almost a half inch here. And then again, just make sure I'm folding my corners. I don't know how to do this officially well, by the way. I uh, need to work on how exactly you're supposed to do sharp corners like this because I ran into problems when I was doing my Victorian costume when I had, what, what did I call it? Dracula ribbon? Like pointed ends of things. I find them kind of hard to sew. Acute points. Anything less than under like 90 degrees, I'm like, ah, uh, what's the best way to do this? <laughs> but I like pointy things, so I should learn. But I will again just kind of top stitch hem the bottom of this sash as well. And again, still working on both portions of this at once. Here I am hemming that. Really a shame that I had to do this in so many pieces. But, oh well. I don't even know if I was able to match the grain line up. I bet no. If I had to, remember. The inside of this, by the way, there's what my points look like. The inside looks like this at that chevron. That's why I left a little bit open so I could do that clean lane here. And then at the very top of this, where it's going to attach into the waist of the dress, I'm going to put in two lines of gathering stitching, just while I'm sitting here. So, a straight edge across the top of this weirdly pointed trapezoidal cornered weird shaped piece. I'm gonna go ahead and put in two lines of gathering stitching about a quarter of an inch apart here at the top, like so, with the largest stitch length on this machine, which is, I believe, seven stitches per inch or six inches per inch, something like that. And then I can go ahead and put that under stitching along my neckline facing here. I'm just holding the seam allowance all is underneath the right hand side here. It's underneath my right hand or right the fingers on my right hand side so I'm stitching the seam allowance down to the facing and it will all get folded in cleanly along the neckline and that unstitching helps 
keep the facing uh, like folded where it needs to be along the neckline and not flipping around so it's useful. This is one of those steps I try not to skip anymore in life. I used to be guilty of skipping understitching at my necklines, but not anymore. After you have to keep ironing your facing all the dang time every time you wear the dress and it's flooping around enough, you just learn to do your understitching and to tack it down to the shoulder seams because it just gets irritating. And here I am, folding that facing down to the inside. Using the end of the ironing board is a good way to do this, by the way. Once you're working with something that's a little bit more 3D. And I had my iron turned down, but it was still giving me a tiny bit of iron shine with the sateen, unfortunately, so I needed to be careful. The more you clip your curves on the inside, the smoother this will lay, by the way. Those are the rules. Apparently I'm just going to finagle it. And here I'm getting frustrated with the fact that this is giving me iron shine. One of my worst enemies, iron shine. Here, I see I even grab a piece of muslin to use as a press cloth because I'm like, stop, don't, <laughs> please. Iron shine, my worst enemy. Actually, I think I need to find a new dry cleaner because the dry cleaner that my parents use, like my mom's taken a couple of my things and a couple of things have come back with a very little bit of iron shine and I just cannot tolerate this nonsense um, because I can't like... If I have to take in, like, let's say, a really nice 1940s suit, if I got that back from the cleaners with, like, a ton of iron shine, which is just undoable, oh, I would be heartbroken. So I might have to find a new cleaner just because, or tell them not to press things whatever way they press it, or, like, to press things gently. I don't know. Iron shine. I'm afraid of it. Weird things that vintage collectors are afraid of. Anyway, here's my skirt. I'm going to start matching up the bodice and sew these together at the waist. But before I can do that, I need to sandwich the sash in between. So I'm going to go ahead and gather down the sash, the waistline. Again, I didn't give you any like measurements or very exact dimensions for this sort of sash thing. I did whatever I could with the amount of fabric I had left. Um, if you just want to have a rectangle, like a big ribbon in here, this isn't the first sash you've seen me do either. I've done them on the channel before. Um, but uh, I just have this like, I don't know, I guess probably one and a half times the distance it's covering. And so it's not too, too gathered. Because again, this is sateen, it's thicker. I can't gather too much of it into this area. Um, it will it will not accept that. But I'm just splitting this over the side seam of the skirt. So there will be a little bit of sash on the back and a little bit of sash on the front. Hopefully you can see what's going on. Because uh, I, unfortunately, as is probably too usual, I'm not all the way here today, as usual. So sorry about that. What would we do if I was fully rested? Imagine how much I could get done if I was fully rested. One day I hope we find out. All right, now that that's gathered down, that's why it's nice to have two lines of gathering stitching. It's so much nicer than using one. If you've only ever used one line of gathering stitching, give yourself two and enjoy the difference. Pinning this down. Again, I wanna make sure I'm not covering those darts in the front also, because if we're gonna do all that dart manipulation to move them so that they're in that fun little angled X marks the spot situation, we don't wanna cover it all up with the sash now, do we? Go ahead and just base this down real quick. So I just brought this over to the machine before I pin the bodice to the waist, which this will be kind of sandwiched in between. I want to make sure that this is just basted down so I don't have to worry about having extra pins in this section and stuff like that. So just throwing a line of basting in here to hold it down in place. And then I will go ahead and make sure all those darts that I drafted so that they would match up are matching up here along the front of the bodice. And I'll pin the side seams together so that they match up with the side seams on the skirt. But just right sides together here with the sash sandwiched in between, I'm going to pin the bodice to the skirt so that I can sew them together and we can start working with the dress instead of separate pieces here. This is where it all comes together quite literally. And of course, just sewing that again with like a 12 inch or a 12 stitch per inch stitch length and the half inch seam allowance as usual over here on the machine. Making sure I'm sewing through all these layers. It is a little bit thick, especially with this medium weight sateen. The sateen isn't too, too bad. Um, you can get cotton sateens that are very heavyweight, and you can get them that are quite lightweight, almost like a shirting. So just make sure you're checking out grams per square meter or ounces per yard, that sort of thing, to find out how thick the fabric is going to be for you. And also, they should say in the description as well. And then the back of this, again, I'm doing it my kind of currently preferred method, which is just to fold each side under the correct amount to the center front, or to the to the center front, the center back. Um, so I'm just folding this along the center back and then I will line this up with the zipper teeth and sew it down and then I will overlap the other side. Um, I kind of start up here at the neckline, pin all the way down to where the end of the zipper is going to be, find that place, then I will sew each side together and then I will continue folding this back. I don't know why I'm doing it this way. 
Um, especially when I know that I'm going to have to explain myself. <laughs> so I'll try and do better about my zippers in the future. Sometimes I do it a little bit slapdash, and then sometimes I remember to take my time because, hey kid, you're on camera, come on. But yes, I've just pinned the section together along the center back underneath where the zipper will be, and I'm just gonna sew that together first. So you can sew this after you put the zipper in too. I just find this helps me be able to get the bottom of the zippers smoother if I have it already sewn. So that's what I'm doing here. And I am gonna leave myself again a little slit in the bottom of the skirt so I can walk because again, I was gonna do that kick pleat, but then I didn't have enough fabric, so here we are. And then bring that over to the table, and you can see I just had that little section below where the zipper will be and above where the slit is that is sewn shut. I'm just gonna give that a quick press, and I'll press down the like opening here at the bottom of the skirt, the slit as it were. And I'm gonna go ahead and stitch this folded side down that I started with before I sewed the backs together to the zipper teeth. Goodness, I'm doing a terrible job of explaining the zipper today. Oh my goodness, it's possible. I need to get some rest. <laughs> oh no. Honestly. Anyway, I'm gonna pin this folded side down. You know how I do my lap zippers, right? You know, you've seen me do it before. Unless you're new here, if this is your first video on my channel, I am so sorry. <laughs> I wish I could, I wish like in somehow I could magically choose which video would be the first one people see of mine. So it wouldn't be any of my messy ones. <clears throat> Anyhow, my zipper is all pinned in place, ready to be sewn. I'm just gonna sew this finished edge real close, about an eighth of an inch away from the zipper teeth all the way down. So I have switched over to a zipper foot here on the machine, like so. And I'm just gonna sew all the way along the zipper, removing the pins as I go along, stitching that first side down as close to the zipper teeth as can be allowed, really. You wouldn't want to go any closer than this, otherwise the zipper wouldn't work anymore. Then I can go ahead and make sure the other side is folded down that same amount, using the area where it's like already seam allowance as a guide. Hopefully that you know what I mean there. Down at the end of the zipper, it's already been used as seam allowance for the seam underneath. So I can just keep it all consistent, but I just use my hem gauge there to make sure I'm measuring it as I go, honestly. Just give it a pin and a press, turn everything right side out. Super bummed about this oil stain on my <laughs> new-ish, I mean, I say new, I got the new ironing board cover about a year ago. <sighs> I guess it lasted several months without getting messed up, so I should be happy, but seeing as the ironing board is often on camera, I should like it to look its best, honestly. Anyway, I'm just overlapping this second edge over the zipper here, so I can sew my lapped zipper in place. And uh, some pins perpendicular, some pins parallel, you know, there's no rules. You can't tell me what to do. <clears throat> just make sure that that waist seam is matched up so that when the zipper is zipped up, that, well, first of all, that the dress fits properly, but also that the waist seam matches up side to side there. That's the most important one. I always actually just sew over that pin that you see at the waist there. That one I just leave in because I want that waist seam to match up. And then over here, I'm just using the other side of the zipper foot here, pressing it up against the zipper teeth that's underneath the fabric, and just riding along those zipper teeth to sew this other lapped side down so that it will cover the zipper. And uh, alas, we have a lapped zipper. A lot of people do railroaded or centered zippers instead. I just prefer to lap zipper and I do them weirdly. So, you know, zippers are again, one of those things where it's like, whatever way you need to do it so that both you and the zipper survive, I always say that's the best way to do it. Everyone can have their own method. I see no reason why not. And I can go ahead and fold my facing down inside here. Just make sure everything is smooth because I will need to sew it down over the zipper tape a little bit on the inside of the back neckline edge. So I'm just folding that into place here probably kind of hard to see what I'm doing. The camera's even having a little bit of trouble with the black and the gray here. And I do, when I trim my zippers like that, because they're nylon, I do just melt it a little bit so that they will never fray. Mostly it will be covered anyway, but I'm just pinning my facing into place here and I will hand stitch it down and I will tack it again at the side or at the um, shoulder seam as well, honestly. And then down here for the slit again, I will actually just hand hem this down as well. And then I will hand hem the hem turn it up a half inch and then another inch here 
So I'll go ahead and pin that hem while I'm here, just so that I can have everything pinned and ready to go, bring this over to my desk, and then do all my hand stitching at once. So here I am just pressing that hem. Again, I've got my hem gauge here just to help me. Make sure this is an inch all the way across, all the way from one side of the skirt to the other. Again, um, I remember that question I'm recent my, recently in my sewing Q&A about like how long do you let hems hang? And for something like this, a pretty firmly woven fabric and the skirt is cut straight, I don't let it hang at all. I'm just gonna immediately hem it. So that's what I'm gonna do here. And then I'm not gonna show you me hand stitching this hem because I have done that step here on the channel several times. And uh, at this point, I think it was late in the evening and I was like ready to be done. So alas, I was like, I can't, and my memory cards were, when I was filming this project, all my memory cards were like already full. And so actually uh, I went out this week, I had a doctor's appointment near a Target and I popped into Target, which I had not been to a Target since probably before the pandemic. I don't know, a long time, <laughs> maybe over a year. And I popped down to the electronics department and just bought myself a couple more memory cards because I'm tired of mine always being full because I refuse to delete footage until a video is uploaded because I'm always like, what if I accidentally delete footage that I haven't copied and then I'm screwed? <laughs> so a lot of my memory cards are always full. I always need more space. But other than hemming this, the last step for this dress is to cover my shoulder pads here because I'm just going to tack these in place on the inside of the dress. Um, I'm not gonna sew them in in a permanent way because I want to be able to wash and dry this dress, but I will remove the shoulder pads when doing so. And you can see here, I have the shoulder pad placed across the center of a square of rayon lining fabric here is what this is and i'm pinning it down the uh, di i'm pinning it diagonally down the center like this to be able to use the bias the 45 degree angle of the fabric to move along the curves of the shoulder pad here so that's why i have it pinned on the bias like this is that it means it will have a little bit more shaping and curve to it i'm just going to pin it like this and then i will trim the excess fabric around the edge of this if i had a serger that had a knife on it i wouldn't actually have to trim this but my serger this knife is broken, so that won't do. But I'm just gonna baste this to the shoulder pad real fast, just with some hand basting stitches, large hand basting stitches. Just basting this around the edge so that I can remove these pins and trim the edge. And then I will just run this curved edge through the serger um, real quick, so I'll show you that. But don't need, to, don't need to be couture about your shoulder pads. I mean, if you are, again, for those of you who sew much nicer than I do, I can't believe you watch my videos because I would think it would be too frustrating, honestly. Um, but I don't know, I guess part of my mission is that you don't have to be a couturier to make your own clothes in some ways, you know? You have to find the balance that works for you. All right, so there's my little shoulder pad trimmed. I'm just gonna serge this edge, all these layers together over here on the serger. Run that through real fast here. Then I'm gonna leave the ends long and then I'll thread them back through with a needle, which is a nice way to finish these just so that the threads aren't loose. Although there do seem to be some loose threads going on here. Over here, I'm just grabbing a bodkin, which is like a large eyed needle, and just feeding those threads back into themselves, and then cutting the excess off. Just a nice way to finish loose serger threads like this, like so. And I will have both shoulder pads the same here, and then I can go ahead and pin them into the dress, and then just tack them on real quick with a couple of stitches. Again, these, I'm packing them into place with a couple of stitches, but every time I wash this dress, I will have to remove them and sew them back in. But that's kind of suffering that I'm willing to do for a strong shoulder, you know? Again, most people are trying to cut shoulder pads out, but I'm happy to add them in. You can see I'm pu putting pins down the center of my shoulder pads here, and that is so I can feel it through the fabric, so I can line up the center of the shoulder pad underneath the center of the shoulder seam here on the dress, and I'll pin that in place. Same up here, near the neckline, like so. And then again, I will just tack that underneath here, and then under here on, along the facing as well. So just throwing in a couple of stitches to hold those in so that I can be as strong shoulders as possible with this dress. And here is my completed black sateen femme fatale dress. I'm quite in love with this little black dress. We know it's not the first and nor will it be the last of the little black dresses I've added to my wardrobe in the last few years, but I just, you know, I love wearing black. It's something I've come to terms with over the past 
year or so here trying to do some closet clearing and really refining my style a little bit, I'm always reaching for black. And so when I want to reach for something strong shouldered in black, I now have this option in my wardrobe. I hope you enjoyed seeing how this dress came together today. I am super happy with it and can't wait to wear it all the time, honestly, or at least if I were to leave the house more often, then I would be able to wear it all the time, but we'll see how it goes. Thank you as always for watching this video today, and I'll be back here with more vintage fashion and sewing real soon. Bye.